God is good. Um, I'm going to go into prayer. I'm not going to be long because the presence of the Lord is already in this place. So, Lord, we just thank you, Father, for this morning. Father, we thank you for, for bringing us here today, O oh God. Father, I ask, Lord, that as I decrease, you increase, O oh God. Let every word that I speak, Father, let it be from you and not from my own emotions, my own thoughts, O oh Lord. So I pray for every heart to receive, um, anoint their ears, Father, to understand, O oh God. And we just thank you. We praise you, Father, for what you're doing this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so today's uh, teaching is the basics of deliverance. And I really felt led to, to give a teaching on deliverance. And this is, in the, this is like a 10-part, but I, I'm going to squeeze them into multiple parts in one. But um, I remember Minister Cynthia sharing that, you know, before Apostle went to be with the Lord, that he was pressing on her teach deliverance, teach deliverance. Because the people are coming, and they are. Um, Tuesday, we were here, and we had two young men travel from up by Wisconsin. They lived, and they came here for deliverance. And they were looking for apostle. But, you know, we're, we're all equipped to do it if we're willing to step into it if we're uh, willing to allow the Lord to use us to do that, right? So they're coming, and we all need to pre be prepared because he's also sending us out. When we go into places, remember, we have the authority through Jesus Christ to cast out evil spirits, right? To set the captives free, to heal the sick. Um, and so we need to, we need to stop, start operating in that especially now because we're living in the last hour and I and I won't I, I can't say that enough we are living in the last days yeah. and um, souls are God's heartbeat the Word of God says that he's not willing that any would perish but that all would come to repentance and so when we have the opportunity to to minister to somebody and and we miss it or they're going through something and, and we and we aren't there to help them um, you know, it's kind of like you're walking away with blood on your hands. We're going to give an account for those opportunities that we missed. And we don't want to miss them in this hour. Because just like the enemy is prowling around like a lion looking for he, who he can devour, we need to be prowling around the same way, right? Who can we save? Who can we draw into the kingdom? Deliverance is a major part of the ministry. It was a major part of Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus set the tone for us. He set the standard for us, right? How we should be operating as disciples, because we're all disciples. And deliverance, don't be afraid of it, because the Word of God says that deliverance is the children's bread. Who are the children? We're the children, right? Those of us who are believers and followers of Christ, deliverance is for us, because not one of us can sit here and say that we aren't dealing with something in one sense or another that we want to be set free from. We should desire or even covet deliverance to want to be set free to walk in freedom every day, right? And it's nothing to be ashamed of. Another thing I want to say is that in deliverance, um, you know, you got to be willing to let some of that dignity down. You got to if you're too afraid to come to somebody or come up front and receive deliverance, then you're operating in a spirit of pride and you need deliverance from pride. And so we need to come and, and not care about what anyone's going to think or whether or not we're going to manifest all crazy, right? Like we just want to be set free, desire freedom. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the pattern of Jesus because in order to operate in deliverance, we've got to have some understanding of what deliverance even is, right? Um, let's see. Okay. So the pattern of Jesus. How many agree that today, more than ever, this world is obsessed with the subject of the demonic? Yeah. It's everywhere. We don't even have to wait for Halloween to come. It's literally all year round, everywhere. TV shows such as Medium, Ghost Whisper, Charmed, the list goes on. I mean, it's so demonic, the entertainment is. And they're teaching everything but truth. 
about that, right? I know my son, he's so, um, the Lord really draws him into uh, deliverance. You know, he's very, um, he, he's, I won't say fascinated, but he's like really, really has a desire to learn about, you know, the spiritual realm. And a lot of his friends will say, oh, you like paranormal stuff? And you like, oh, ghost and haunted house? And they don't understand it, right? And my son is 15, and he'll say, no, it's not paranormal stuff. You know, but he has to be careful because they don't have an understanding of what, he's, what he is um, learning about. So let us not be ignorant, right, like the rest of them, thinking it's paranormal. It is not paranormal stuff. Let us learn what the Bible has to say about the occult, death, and demons. You'll see it is very different from what the media portrays. So a question that I used to ask a lot because I would hear it a lot, can a Christian be demon-possessed? And I'm sure a lot of you will say no, right? We can't be possessed. Because when we're believers, we're possessed by one person. We have possession. One person has possession of us, and that is Jesus Christ, right? But let's begin to consider this side of the ministry of Jesus, and we're going to look further into that. Who were the ones that he was delivering, right? When he began his public ministry, the thing that struck people the most was the way of dealing with evil spirits. Take note that this particular miracle of Jesus, it was never previously recorded in the Old Testament. I don't know how many of you read, have read the Old Testament, but I can't find one account where it does talk about setting people free of evil spirits. We read that in the New Testament. So almost all his other miracles, healing, provision of food, control of nature, all of those were recorded in the Old Testament. And then we read it again in the New Testament. But not the expelling of evil spirits. Here's the first account in a synagogue in Capernaum. It says in Mark 1, 23, Mark 1, 23, now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. He wasn't outside of the church. He was in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. So the Greek says in an unclean spirit. Now I'm going to go over a lot of the translations because in the translation, one little word can change what it means, right? We, it could give us a different translation. So the Greek says, in an unclean spirit, which is not translatable into English. The best contemporary English would be under the influence of an unclean spirit. So there are three phrases that are used more or less interchangeably. Demons, evil spirits, and unclean spirits. Also specific types of spirits. There's a spirit of infirmity and a spirit of fear. It says, there was a man in their synagogue. This is a New King James Version. So there was a man in their synagogue under the influence of an unclean spirit. He cried out. Now notice, the he is not the man the scripture is referring to the spirit and not the man. He's saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now that is the spirit talking to Jesus. Now notice the evil spirits instantly identify who Jesus is. But yet it took his disciples almost a year to know who he was. But that unclean spirit knew instantly. They feared him. Also notice the combination of we and I. Spirits will use singular and plural a lot of the times. Um, when Jesus spoke to the man in Gadara, he said, what is your name? He's speaking singular. And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. So again, the interchanging of we and I. 
And verse 25, we're still in Mark 1. Mark 1. Uh, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Jesus didn't even fuss with him. He didn't even let him have a word. He was like, shut up. You're coming out, right? So in, in deliverance, we don't need to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Because we're, we're operating in that same authority. The Greek literally says, be muzzled, come out of him. Verse 26 says, and when the unclean had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Convulsed is a person to suffer a violent, involuntary contraction of the muscles, producing contortion of the body or limbs. So it was pretty dramatic. Notice there was very dramatic physical manifestations. It was not the kind of behavior that was normal in the synagogue. So imagine, they were very religious in those times, you know. Um, and for this behavior to operate in the synagogue, it was not normal. Most churches would have put that man out, yeah. right? We see somebody coming up in here and acting up, and they're causing all this distraction. We're gonna, we're gonna, first thing people are going to want to do is throw them out, right? But no, when you're a ministry that operates in deliverance, you're like, ooh, bring them up. We're going to set them free, right? So I want to point out that Jesus did not deal with the man. You're not dealing with the person. He dealt with the spirit in the man. And nowhere does it indicate that the man was behaving in any other manner than normal beforehand. It was the presence of Jesus with the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon him that brought out the unseen presence of the demon in that man. Did you catch that? It was the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon him that made that evil spirit go, right? Now, the same day later on this chapter, in verse 32 and 34, we read a further development of Jesus' ministry. Verse 32 says, Now at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Now, demon-possessed is not a likable translation in the deliverance ministry. The Greek word is um, dynamism, right? Thank you, Cynthia. If written in English letters, it would be something like this. Diamond is the root word and comes from the noun demon. Ismai is the passive, meaning to be demonized. So that would be the best translation, to be demonized and not demon-possessed. This translation, demon-possessed, it causes confusion, right? It causes confusion because the issue for millions of people, they say, well, how can a Christian be demon-possessed? By the devil, if they're a Christian, right? See, a true Christian cannot be possessed by the devil. A true Christian is possessed by Jesus. But in many areas in their lives and character where they are not themselves and fully in control, they are affected by a demon operating within them. And they are demonized, but not possessed by Satan. So I want us all to be clear that you can still have unclean spirits demons operating being a Christian. It says, and they were demonized but not possessed by Satan. In Acts 10, 38, Peter preached in Cornelius' house saying, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Again, he had the Holy Spirit and then the power. He takes the word demon possessed and puts it all into one word, oppressed. He said healing all who were oppressed. Oppressed. So a Christian may be under power, vexed, or under the influence of a demon, but this does not mean that they are under ownership or possession of one. A Christian may have a particular area in their life under control of a demon, but the beauty of it is, and the glory of it is, is that we can all be set free. The New Testament hardly makes any distinction between all who were sick and all who were possessed, right? All who were demonized. 
And Jesus didn't either. See, when Jesus healed the sick, he was also casting out evil spirits. It always went hand in hand. There was no separation in it. And that's what we should do today. When we open up this altar for prayer, we should all be equipped to not only lay hands on the sick, but to cast out evil spirits. Verse 33 says, And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. The King James Version and the New King James Version and various other versions use the word cast out demons. The translation in the J.B. Phillips, if you guys don't have that one, it's the New Testament translation. It's amazing. It gives so much understanding about the New Testament. Where he uses the word expel because that doesn't have a lot of religious meaning. It's a simple and it's practical. So what we're doing is expelling anyone who is demonized, right? It's expelling those evil spirits. If you inhale smoke into your lungs to release it, you're expelling it, right? And it takes a muscle to do that, right? Right? So when they're coming up here, that's going to be the process. They don't have to speak a word. They don't say anything. You're going to call that unclean spirit out, that spirit of infirmity, and it just takes one action. Because you're now expelling it. You're, you're, you're operating in that to release it, right? You don't, want it in, you don't want it to stay there. You expel it. You force it out. You eject it. It's an action of the will, but there's also a physical aspect to it. He expelled many demons, that translation says. He did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Again, we don't have to be up here going back and forth with a, with a demon. You have the authority to tell it to shut up. Be quiet. Now let's read in Mark 1.39. It says, He was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. J.B. Phillips' translation says he continued throughout the whole of Galilee preaching in their synagogues and expelling demons. I like that word, continued. He never took a break. He didn't stop casting up, right? He continued all through Galilee. Can you imagine going into every synagogue and casting out? Some of us don't even want to come here any more than a Sunday, but Jesus was operating seven days a week, casting out and healing the sick. He brings out the fact that, in this translation, he brings out the fact that um, this was not an isolated event that took place in one synagogue, but that it was his regular practice in every synagogue to do two things, preach and expel demons. And he did it through the whole of Galilee. Now, a lot of people have the idea that perhaps the need to expel demons only happens now and then, right? I was one of those who think that it's a very rare occasion that somebody would have to expel a demon. Not true. And when it occurs with people, I, that was me. I used to think, man, they must be some wicked people having them demons up in them. Oh, they must be in jail or... Doing things, right? That, like, that doesn't happen to the Christians. But that's not true at all. The people that Jesus was healing and delivering were us. Us. But let me point out to you again that Jesus was not dealing with those kinds of people. The people that we thought wicked. Not Christians. He was dealing with Orthodox Jews who met every Sunday in the synagogue and spent the rest of the week caring for their families. They were good people, tilling their fields, fishing the sea, keeping their stores on, you know, and so on. These were good people. They were normal, respectable, but they had what we could say certain hang-ups. How many can admit we have certain hang-ups, right? Certain areas where they were not in control of themselves. 
So don't get stuck on the idea that a person needs, who needs deliverance must be a criminal or a maniac. Good, respectable people like us who attend church and say the right things, but we have areas that we need some dealing with. <laughs> Let us look at Luke 4, verse 40 and 41. Verse 40 says, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. See, the ministries of healing and deliverance were interwoven. They came because they were sick. But in many cases, their cure demanded the expelling of evil spirits. And not, notice that Jesus laid his hands on every one of them. He laid his hands on them. There used to be, um, and still is, there's this traditional way of thinking that it's unscriptural to lay your hands on somebody who has an evil spirit. If that's so, then Jesus was unscriptural. And I'd rather follow Jesus than tradition or anyone here today. So let's look at Luke 13. And we're going to read about the woman who was bent over. Luke 13, 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Now notice this was a, it says, caused by a spirit of infirmity, an evil spirit that had doubled her body over so that she couldn't straighten herself up. Can you imagine being doubled over for 18 years? Verse 12 says, But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Notice the word loose. It indicates binding, right? The word of God says that he has given us the keys to the gates, right? Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Verse 13 says, and he laid his hands on her. Now notice, she had a spirit of infirmity, and he laid his hands on her. And immediately, she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? So what is he saying? We're going to loose seven days a week. We're going to loose every time the opportunity comes, right? When we want to be set free, it doesn't, it's not going to take something uh, uh, special. We don't have to set the scene. We don't have to. We walk in that power and authority through Jesus Christ, right? She was a believing woman. She was a Jewess. She was a member of the synagogue. She had this terrible physical problem. Her back was bent over. So again, she wasn't some wicked woman out in the world, you know, who wasn't following Christ. It was not primarily a physical problem. I remember Prophetess Harleen said, uh, she gave a teaching, and she said, we have to ask ourselves, is it physical or is it spiritual? And that's where we need to constantly pray for discernment, right? Because it's going to take discerning to see these things and to call them out. The moment the spirit of infirmity left her, she straightened up. Some problems we categorize as physical, but again, they're spiritual. Jesus also dealt with dumbness, deafness, and blindness as being caused by what? Not sickness, evil spirits. 
and in many cases his ministry to heal the people was to deliver them from the spirits that caused their dumbness, their deafness, and their blindness. Right? So a lot of times when people are coming up here and they're asking for healing, you're not really dealing with a physical problem. You're dealing with a spirit of infirmity. Now let's look at Luke 13, 31 and 32. On that very same day, some Pharisees came saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. They're talking to Jesus, right? And he said to them, Go tell that fox. He's talking about Herod. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Now, we're living in the last hour, right? And persecution is coming to the church. It's already here. And they're going to start locking people up more than ever for speaking and wanting to operate in these things. So are we going to cower and listen to the religious people and not cast out demons and not heal the sick? Or are we going to tell that fox that we're going to operate 24-7, seven days a week, right? What he said it was a Hebrew expression. Today, tomorrow, and the third day means from now on until the job is finished. So Christians, I don't care how old you are, we can see our sisters right here, Minister Connie and Apostle Rosa. It doesn't matter how old we are, it doesn't matter how young we are. Our job is not finished until he says so. So he said, I'm going to be doing two things, casting out demons and performing cures. That's what Jesus said. That's how he started, that's how he continued. And that's how he ended. His whole ministry from be- beginning to end included in two, in it as a major part, probably one third of his lifetime, healing sick and casting out demons. And the two were so intertwined that it was really impossible to distinguish them. He operated in those two all the time. They came hand in hand, hand in hand. In the New Testament, no one was ever sent out to evangelize without first being commissioned to deal with evil spirits. Let me say that again. No one was sent out to evangelize until they were equipped in this deliverance and healing. So we should all be operating this way. So let's look at the first 12 disciples who were sent out. Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 1. Verse 1 says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Notice the first thing he did was to give them authority to deal with evil spirits. We have authority to deal with evil spirits. He's not telling them to just go out and preach. He's not going out and telling them to give some words of flattery and courage. No, he's telling them to go out and deal with the evil spirits. He instructs to do more than all of that. And that is to cast out unclean spirits and heal the sick. It was included in their equipment, right? He equipped them. And it was also included in their commission. So again, he's not asking us. He's instructing us to do this. So we should desire to operate in the deliverance ministry. Luke 10, verse 1, um, also talks about, let's see, verse 1. And these things the Lord appointed, 70 others also. So some religious people will say that was for that time and that was for those 12. But then he called 70 more. And what did he do? He said, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now let's read in 17, verse 17, about the report that those 70 brought back. Remember, he sent them out. And this is the report of the 70 when they came back. Verse 17 says, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
So what had them so excited? They had authority over demons. Verse, verse 18 says, And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then we look at the final commission at the end of the Gospels, Mark 16. Verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. So what are we commissioned to do, family? That's right. So what is the first, first sign that he gave that would follow in his name? Cast out demons. He did not send them out without first making sure that they knew how to deal with demons. Now in Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and, the, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. We can't pick and choose what we want to listen to and what we want to obey. If we are going to yield, submit, and obey, it's going to be all of his commands. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. He told them to teach their disciples everything he taught them. And one of the main things he taught them was how to deal with evil spirits. And he said, when you make disciples, you teach them what I have taught you. And when they make disciples, they will teach them what they've been taught. And he said, I am with you to the end of age. He made no plan for that process to change. He never said, just for a moment, just when you feel like it, right? He never, never made that process to change. It was a continual thing. He expects the same to go on from the time he left to the time he returns. That is his program. The tragedy is that the church departed from it. How many of you can say that you, you go places or you know other Christians that are casting out demons, that it's a lifestyle, that it's something that they do all the time? No. But not New Heart. We're equipping, right? And now we're being equipped so that you can go and equip others to do the same. Did you know that Philip is the only one in the New Testament other than Jesus who was called to evangelize? 28 persons are called apostles, but only one person calls an evangelist. Verse 5 in Acts 8 says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So he was an evangelist. He went out and he preached, right? But his message was very simple. It was done. It was a one-word message. In Samaria, he preached Christ. On the road to Gaza, he preached Christ. And then verse 6 tells us, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were demonized, possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So take note that the first thing he did as an evangelist was drive out evil spirits. So that is just part of the beginning of Basics of Deliverance. I wanted you guys to hear the pattern of Jesus. That was his ministry, casting out evil spirits and healing the sick. And then anything that was associated with that, right? So now we have an understanding that it's not just one person that should be doing this. It's all of us that should be doing this. And we should all desire to want to be set free. Every believer should walk in freedom, right? And don't be ashamed if there are some areas in your life that you need deliverance from, right? There's no shame in it. The shame is when we continue to be oppressed by the enemy, and we don't want that deliverance in fear of what everyone's going to talk about. 
It doesn't matter about what man says about us because when you know that you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven and he's going to say, good job, my good and faithful servant, he's pleased with you, that's all that matters. Apostle used to say, even if you're going to end up in a chicken coop, get to heaven, right? But we don't have to end up in a chicken coop because we can be working now. So everything that we're doing, it's for his glory, it's for his honor. It's all for him, everything that we do. And when we get there, that's where the blessings come, right? So even if we are not seeing it here, even if you're not driving the car you want to drive and the house you want and the millions of dollars you want, still walk, walk like you are, right? Because we are um, um, children of the Most High King, right? We are heirs to the throne. So don't walk around defeated. Don't walk around poor with that mentality of lack. No, know who you are, your identity in Christ, and walk in power and authority. We are not weak, punk Christians. We have to walk like we would walk in the world, right? In authority, with confidence, right? Knowing that, not to boast in ourselves, but knowing that everything we're doing is through him and for him in Jesus' name, right? So that ends today's teaching. I'm going to pray us out, and then the altar will be open for prayer for anyone who wants prayer today or deliverance. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your word today, O oh God. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are doing it, O oh God, that you're training us, that you're teaching us, that you're equipping us, O oh God. We thank you, Father, that, Lord, that you're aligning us with your desires for us, O oh God, aligning us with your mind, aligning us with your character, aligning us with your heart, O oh God. And, Father, forgive us, O oh God, when we hesitate, Father, when we don't operate in these things, O oh God. But, Father, we are giving you all of ourselves today. We are submitting wholeheartedly to you, O oh God. Have your way in our lives in Jesus' name. And I pray for every person as they leave that you would bless them, that you would cover them, that you would protect them. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 Yes, I can. Altars open for anyone who needs prayer. Amen. Oh, that's, I love that. Let me turn this off. It's my second one. I know. I'm so happy to see you. I know.